That's what I did. <laughs> That's what I did. You did, didn't you? Yeah. Looking fantastic. I've so... still got all mine on the back of my head. I don't know if anyone can see. Looks like, yes. It's still there, the mullet. Looking great, guys. Great Thanks. smooth start. All right. Uh, let's have a look at those front pages. So, the Daily Mail uh, goes with plot to crown Morden as PM. The Telegraph has Mercer faces jail over Afghan inquiry. The Times has Church playing race card. And iNews has Deliveroo and Uber Eats backdoor to illegal migration. Uh, Express has Hunt's olive branch to fearful pensioners. And finally, the Daily Star, mystery of the rampant beavers. And those were your front pages. OK, kicking things off with the Daily Mail, Josh. Yeah, plot to crown Morden as PM. So, yeah, the Tories getting desperate. They're all about to be out of a job in a couple of months and they just want to do one last spin of the wheel just to see if they can finally get on an electable leader. Uh, I don't think it's going to do any good. They've, they've landed on Penny Morden. She has a lot of <laughs> skills. She wears a cape well. She can carry a sword. And admittedly, those used to be very useful skills when it came to running the country. <laughs> Unfortunately, now there are other things that are required as well, like recognising what a woman is. Well, I, there's that, I mean, apparently she's good at diving as well. Did you know that? I didn't I know just that. just found that out. OK, tonight. well, apparently she's got she my was vote. on some celebrity splash programme, which isn't as dirty as it's out. Sorry. Um, so, Liam, <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think at this point, I mean, with Rishi, they're definitely going down. So why not? Why not gamble? Why not <laughs> yeah. see what's in the mystery box if we go for Penny Morden? <laughs> the thing that sort of undermines the, the sort of uh, how much people really believe that Penny is the, the person to lead the party to victory says uh, this, the mystery source says that uh, there's a feeling that we cannot go, out, go on as we are and that even Penny would be better. <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Sounds like you really believe in her. That's I, fantastic. Good I do luck. think that they're being silly. I think the only person who genuinely did, would have a chance would be Kemi Badenoch. Yeah. Even but now? She's, even now. She, I mean, because she has good communication skills. She's yeah. plain speaking. She says it as it is. I don't necessarily mm. agree with everything that she says. Certainly agree on some of the stuff about, like, knowing what a woman is and fighting for women's rights. Um, but she seems to be a good communicator. And yeah. against someone like Keir Starmer, who I... I I know you guys have different feelings about, but I think he has positive qualities as well. I, I don't think, think communication. I don't say. I just don't think communication is necessarily at the top of his skills. No, I've... wait. Imagine getting trapped in a lift with one of them. Wouldn't you rather be trapped with Kemi than? Well, well, actually, one of my fantasies. <laughs> is, uh, but I, th I think Penny Morden, she's getting too much stick for, uh, for you know, her taking a sort of overly woke view on what a woman is. You know, because, uh, because we've got to remember, a couple of years ago, nobody knew what a woman was. Everybody's running around being like, what, what's a woman? Nobody knows. Keir Starmer's like, I don't know. Have they got penises? Have they got big elephant ears? Have they got 20 legs and walk like a centipede? Nobody had any idea. So, you know, I, I don't think we can judge her by the standards of 16 months but ago. But we would at least want to know that she's got a firmer opinion now, wouldn't we? Well, I think that she still does lie towards that side, and they're saying that the only way that they'll let her in as leader is if she hands all of that stuff over to the more right of the party. Yeah, mm. But it's amazing that it's a right-wing issue. So the, the Stick to the weapons. The Tory party are going to have a, a, a what-a-woman-is wing of the party to decide <laughs> that. A committee. A what-a-woman-is committee. Great. All in favour? I'll get there in the end. OK. Uh, moving on to the I, Leo. So the I has a surprisingly uh, great bit of investigative journalism by the I. Uh, so Deliveroo and Uber Eats uh, are a back door to UK illegal migration. Obviously, they should be coming to the front door uh, with the food. <laughs> But, yeah, apparently uh, thousands of these, uh, the riders' accounts, so, you know, if you want to deliver food for, for Deliveroo or Uber Eats or whatever, uh, you can actually just sell or, or rent out your, your, um, your sort of pass to, to do that to, yeah. to other people. And there, there are like, over 100,000 people on Facebook groups doing this. It's really, it's really shocking. And it's unsafe. Uh, you know, the, often the riders don't have the insurance. It's apparently the, uh, the, the responsibility of the rider who holds the account to make sure that whoever they're renting the account to does like obviously they're not going to do it you know what i mean like you know, i don't think they've got an hr department they, do they? they don't individually I mean, mm. deliver do but these individual yeah. riders don't uh, some people have complained uh, as, as well as the insurance issue and the fact that it's enabling Ill illegal migration because you can come over and and you know, rent one of these passes to deliver food for delivery so without... once somebody's in the country what you're saying is they haven't got any papers they can't go anywhere else they can't get on a decent a real payroll somewhere no ni number 
deliver it. Can you can bonus. still, yeah, for 70, 70 quid a week or something, you can get a, a Deliveroo account, rent a Deliveroo account, and then deliver, deliver food. But obviously, you haven't been through any safety training. You've still got all your attitudes that you're bringing from whatever medieval country you're coming from to, to, to women. So, you know, so this we might woman, have some poor customer service. Or yes, better, this, this woman, know. Becca, she like ordered groceries using Deliveroo. Some guy turns up at her door and he's all like, Ah, oh, you pretty lovely lady and all this sort of stuff. Sorry for doing the accent, uh, but, you know, beautiful he girl. Indian. A beautiful girl, lovely girl. No, he's Scottish. I think Can't the you language you're supposed to use is that he made her feel unsafe or uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, he made her feel uncomfortable. But then Becca, obviously not a real name, uh, who did you vote for? Did you vote for liberal parties that are all for like open borders and anybody can come here and anything that floats? It's like, yeah, you made you made this happen, Becca, and now it's happening to you. Have you learnt your lesson? Probably not. I, I feel for Becca. I think she'd probably rather have that delivery driver arrive there than Leo grilling her about her politics. Yeah. That would be more... There's a bunch of reasons why this is a bad idea. This isn't actually... I don't believe it was them who first uncovered this. It was covered mm -hmm. now the newspaper. Yeah, well, we have the story, but I guess they've looked yeah. into it a bit more. But, yeah, of course, women's safety. Anyone say every... You know, when I get home from work from here, I'll order an Uber Eats or whatever, and it's always someone who's different. Uh, mm. But there's also this idea that they could even be, like, part of a modern slavery gang and they're sort of being sent out there. Uh, so there's a bunch of reasons why they need to obviously clamp down on this. But for me, the biggest issue is, do you tip in cash and then don't tip because on the app, but then it looks like you're cheap on the app? That's... Yeah. that. I do you, do you want, do you want That's the that? real dilemma here. I, I can't believe okay. you're asking me. Okay. If, I mean, tipping. <laughs> it's the wrong well, no, You never tip. Really? You never, you never tip. I always... Delivery. You've already got to pay loads of money for it. No, and also, like, what, like, I just found out that, you know, they're, they're not even. They're cheating the Home Office. I was, I was intrigued to. They, they interviewed some of the riders uh, who said, well, I went to the Home Office and presented all my documents, and the Home Office said no. I was like, Wow, that's amazing. The Home Office actually doing their jobs for once. I mean, not to the point of actually, you know, uh, making illegal people go home. Can only hope. OK, the Times now. What are they going with, Josh? Church playing race card. Uh, Ex Equality Tsar criticises C of E's slavery fund and says Britain is less divided than 40 years ago. So this is Lord Sewell. Uh, he, he headed up the Boris Johnson's Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. He's got a book coming out called Black Success, uh, The Surprising Truth. Uh, and he was really sort of uh, made into a villain by l members of black community, not all the black community, because it's a disparate group, but as, as and, and sort of actually there was quite a lot of racism directed towards him right. because the results that they found in it didn't meet people's expectations, i.e. the UK wasn't the most racist place in the whole world, and actually money... Like how much money you're born into has a m much bigger impact. Uh, it's not that race plays no impact, but anyway, the point is, he's we ha we covered the story how the Church of England they they sort of they said we're going to give a hundred million because we you know what happened back in the day, and then they go well actually we're going to give it a billion, but it won't be our money; it'll just be some other Christians and, <laughs> <laughs> and well, who feel guilty. Quid, haven't they, the Church? They're, they've got a, a few quid put by for this sort of eventuality. Yeah, and I guess they are an institution that uh, that depends on guilt. <laughs> so uh, you can understand understand this, but I think the the whole idea of reparations uh, is ridiculous. So taking money from people who haven't done anything wrong uh, to give it to people who uh, those people didn't do anything to them. Well, is... that's it. How do you? I mean, if you if you have a, a half African heritage and a half European, what do you do? Give yourself fifty quid. It's really I don't know who yeah, gets half the money, money and how are you. But this this is. The, uh, the, the whole sort of idea, the philosophy that reparations engenders also means that... Um, so, th if you're saying that people now are responsible for the, for the bad things their ancestors did, you're also saying that people now can claim to all the good things that their ancestors did. So, you know, as a Scot, you know, the invention of the television, the invention of antibiotics, nobody gets to use any of them without giving me loads of money. Well, that seems entirely reasonable. You and are finally... getting paid money. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah, but just one have more. a quick look at the star, Leo. Oh, the star. So uh, the star has damned if we know how they got here. That's a little pun because it's the mystery of the rampant beavers. So there are beavers in Cornwall. Uh, they don't have enough waxing salons, and uh, and the, nobody knows how they got here. And beavers are super cute, and they did want to reintroduce beavers to to the wild um, in in Britain after decades of the the Hollywood. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> hey oh, <laughs> and uh, they're they're super cute animals, but they do knock down trees and damn. Um, 
dam uh, rivers, so you get. Mis- we don't. You're we like don't a nature that. documentary. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> very, very badly informed one. Reading, reading so all this. We don't stuff. know how they got there. They didn't go by train. No, but it turns out they're in the perfect area. Well, for them, I don't know what for the beavers. locals are going to well, think. Well, this you know is, but they the were talking about like. reintroducing them anyway, so I'm thinking someone maybe got a little bit ahead. Head of the curve, and they're like, we're just going to put them in. But where did somebody just snuck a few beavers out? Yeah, I haven't seen a beaver were. in years. Like, where, when where did you see a beaver before? I've seen, I've definitely seen, I've seen them in Canada. Okay, well. And on we the go. internet. <laughs> right, that's it for the front pages. Join us after the break when we'll dive headfirst into Saturday's headlines. See you there. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9 p.m. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. Charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10 a.m. every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Headliners. I'm still Cressida Wetton, and I'm joined by one comedian who thinks Kate is still alive. It's Josh Howey, and another who is suspiciously certain that she's not. That's Leo Curse. Okay, let's start with some bad news for people who love sick notes and being dramatic in Saturday's Telegraph. Josh. Yes, there is no such thing as long COVID. Say, health officials, please do not tweet me what? after this <laughs> show and start going, you're a liar, you're, you're a big farmer owns you, or whatever it is. Uh, or they'll, they'll probably actually wake up tomorrow, won't they? But, um, <laughs> yes, they're saying here, this is uh, in Queensland, Australia, they've looked at the results and they basically say there's no such thing as long COVID per se. What people have been suffering from is a real phenomenon, but it's what happens, like, in a post uh, viral syndrome. Right, which so is we're not common. denying their symptoms there or their are experience, symptoms. but we are denying that it's special. That it's specially, yeah, to a COVID. And the reason why it seems like a lot of people have it is because, of course, lots of people got COVID, mm. if it exists. <laughs> Lewis Schaefer throwing that in, uh, at the same time. So right. that is why it seems like it's a real phenomenon. But if you had a flu or a cold, you may have similar 
symptoms and they would also continue for a long time afterwards. And also you can have the sort of the psychosomatic effect of everybody's talking about long COVID, so then you're like, well, I feel a bit rough, so I've got long COVID as well. Well, isn't it interesting that this is in Australia? Because they talked about COVID an awful lot, didn't yeah. they? They were very mm. keen on it. I've but got that... long gonorrhea. <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> long gonorrhea. Wasn't he a, a pirate? But um, my friend Gaynor, she, she works frontline in the NHS mm. and, uh, and she got COVID uh, early, early on, got it really bad. Um, you know, back when there weren't vaccines or even uh, PPE or masks or anything. She's just, you know, thrown into the pit with all the, the masses. And, uh, and yeah, she got, she got long COVID and attacked. Uh, it's weird, like, long COVID, it seems to attack different parts of your body. I didn't know viruses could, like, target different parts of your body. She's had, she's had problems with inflammation in her cartilage and all sorts of stuff. Mm. Um, oh, so some people, some people have, had, uh, have had it. Yeah, 3% so, right. three, three of the population. 3% of the pop. And this 15. is in Australia or the UK? Uh, they're saying the UK, yeah. But really, they're just trying to say you're not that special. Do you think this is going to force people who maybe have been on the sick for some time to, to have to reevaluate? Oh, they are their... sick. It's just it's yeah long it's long post viral syndrome or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, the Times now, and it turns out thick people were more likely to get COVID. Have I read that right? <laughs> well, it's one way of interpreting the the data. So how COVID made the world stupider. That's uh, it's also made headlines stupid. You, stupid you said you wouldn't do the voice, both of you. <laughs> That's just my voice. Just my voice. <laughs> anyway, a study suggests that exposure to the disease led to brain fog and a drop in IQ. So this was they, they didn't mean to. They weren't looking for the for these results. This is Adam Hampshire at Imperial College uh, in January 2020. He started mm. surveying eight, 80,000 people uh, to to see how changing lifestyle would affect brain function. And obviously, something happened that changed lifestyle quite a lot. Quite a lot. We had uh, Has he got COVID. Any friends in China. I mean, this is a hell of a coincidence. Well, we, we had COVID. We also had lockdown. Though I think lockdown made people. Stupid, but yeah, he's found that uh, those who people who ended up in intensive care had an IQ about nine points lower afterwards. I don't know if that comes back, if Boris is going to get better. Those who had persistent <laughs> symptoms, uh, about six points lower, and uh, even those who just had mild infections were a couple of I IQ points before where they started out. Uh, but yeah, I, th I think lockdown made people stupid as well. Everybody seemed yeah. to trust the government, which is a sign of complete <laughs> idiocy. Uh, we threw away the economy and we threw away all our rights, uh, you know, just because of some. Yeah. Survivable disease. It was quite a shock, wasn't it? You had all these people in your life who you thought you were your mates and you could chat to them about stuff, and you said, oh, you know government overreach, and they all went, no, what? It's fine. <laughs> it was incredible to see um, and to do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so China has basically made us dumber, and the, it's the effect, you know, I'm already pretty dumb, so I need all those little three points that I can get, but as a population yeah. across the planet, this does have an impact on us. Um, and uh, it's also worse if you got the original strain, which I got. And um, it's, uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't even finish the rest of the story. It was, <laughs> it was too difficult. OK, uh, back to Saturday's Telegraph now. And we all know what happens in Vegas is subject to strict controls and staff must prove their stay was necessary and provided value for the taxpayer. That's how it goes, isn't it, Josh? Exactly. MOD chiefs spend millions on luxury hotels. So, uh, yeah, the Ministry of Defence, uh, this is the Telegraph doing a bit of investigation. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they're like, well, obviously, what's happened recently is the MOD are desperately trying to get more money for uh, for armed uh, services, and the Telegraph going, you know, what, I wonder how much they spend on the old hotels. Uh, it turns out they spend a lot of money. Don't know about the Premier Inn, do they? No, they certainly don't. Vegas, uh, New York, Hawaii, Dubai, Caribbean. And they're staying in, like, £350 a night. Uh, there's one in Dubai that's £5,000 a night. So... Uh, six nights. For, oh, five, is it for six nights? Even, whatever. Oh, they didn't stay, uh, that was the one I stayed at, I forgot. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the question is, of course, are we getting the value for money? But also, the age-old debate, do we really want our officials staying in a hostel or something? I bet it's yes. Well, the thing is, if they, if they stay at the La Verda Hotel in Dubai for five grand, they're not going to want to go back to their barracks. They're not going to be happy in their little, like, you know, bunk bed thing with private You don't think they have pile. a nice, uplifting few days and they go back refreshed and, and able to do better work for the nation? I don't know. I just think these posh hotels, these fancy hotels, should be kept for cross-channel migrants and not for hard-working <laughs> members of our defence. Excellent. Good stuff, Leo. Uh, three stories in, and I'm already delighted that someone who believes in gravity and Western medicine is covering the story, <laughs> and not Lewis. It's the Daily Mail, Leo. So, uh, global cancer phenomenon is not just America. The UK, Japan, South Africa and Australia are among dozens of countries suffering mystery spikes 
of all kinds of tumours in young people. So these aren't spiky tumours. They're seeing a lot of uh, tumours in, in young people. And I was thinking, oh, well, what's happened over the last few years? What have we suddenly injected everybody? But it's, n it's not to do with that, apparently, because this is measuring between 1990 and 2019. So cases of cancer in young people uh, across the globe have increased by nearly 80 percent and deaths have risen uh, nearly 30 percent. So this is, I mean, this is pretty huge. Yeah. So they're, they're looking at, you know, what possible uh, issues could it be? Um, obesity, is one of them. Um, alcohol intake, they think, is, a, is another, which uh, that's coming down in young people. So hopefully that's, unfortunately, my generation, we were just getting absolutely loaded all the time. Uh, and also, interestingly, the microbiome, um, like all the bacteria and stuff that live in your body, the thing when that gets disrupted, that can cause inflammation, which uh, can lead to cancer. And also looking at genes, they say there could be genetic causes. It's like your genes don't change. Like, people's genes didn't change between 1990 and 2019. Yeah, but you could have a gene that, once it's stuffed full of modern life, might, might come in, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Stuffed full of modern <laughs> life? You'd well, there are some genes that, like that are later. How's that date the other day? They... <laughs> <laughs> how cruel, how cruel. Um, but, yes, yes it's, don't uh, they don't mention here forever plastics. That was where my brain went mm. to straight uh, away. Yes. Um, but, yeah, and it's interesting that Australia seems to have the highest number of early-onset cancer yeah. and New Zealand second, but they don't mention you would think that might be uh, skin cancer or something but no it's we're talking about breast cancer well, colon Australia cancer Australia are a nation of fatties aren't they sorry Australia um they've got really they were in good high... shape no they're not they've got very really? high obesity levels yeah right. they're not in good shape and they love a drink don't they again uh... how's that date <laughs> did you date in Australia <laughs> or something we didn't date in oh, Australia right, right, right. I, you had I, a lot of information there I, I, they've, they've also got like, I was in Tasmania and you get bug splat in the windscreen so they've still got you know how we're in, in the west you never get bugs splatting on your windscreen anymore because we've eliminated all insect life with our neonicotinoid uh, phosphates and whatever it is. I hadn't noticed that. So, uh, so yeah, in Tasmania, you've still got that sort of natural life. And it's, so it's weird that they're having such high levels of cancer with, you know, still living in a sort of, you know, healthy environment. Well, that's it. The good news is that the UK are 28th. So it's the first time that being <laughs> rubbish at something has actually helped us out. Could be lower. OK, back to the Telegraph. Uh, see, Hamas just want a permanent ceasefire. That's, that's all they want. Any thoughts on this, Josh? <laughs> yeah. Israel talks with Hamas back... Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Israel talks with Hamas back on as terror group drops permanent ceasefire demand. Um, there's been a back and forth. America, particularly, was, was very... Uh, Biden really wanted to get the ceasefire in place before Ramadan. It didn't happen. And finally, uh, Hamas have gone, yeah, all right, we'll, we'll go back to the table. They've taken the permanent ceasefire off. They're talking about exchanging 1,000 terrorists, mm -hmm. murderers, for 100 civilians and babies uh, and uh, women and old people. Uh, but Israel obviously wants to get its hostages back. Uh, but, but I would say that a big part of this is because uh, that they have Hamas in a, in a bad position. They've killed but reportedly two-thirds of their battalions, about 20,000 people, although, according to Hamas, they've killed none, no one, right. just civilians. Uh, but this is, this is... You have to be in a position of strength to get to this point. Right, so you're saying Netanyahu's <coughs> winning at this point? Well, they've, they've, they've got so far... I wouldn't say it's Netanyahu, whoever was the prime minister. A lot of people right. go, oh, Netanyahu, he's the evil one. It's like no country would have an option but to do what Israel has done whoever the leader was. Well, what the West usually do is say, oh, don't look back in anger and it'll all be fine. It's the relig religion of peace and if anybody says anything, they're racist. I feel terrible for the families of the hostages. Uh, we made it to the break in one piece. Coming up, sexist aircon, German robots and Humza Yusuf battles the Scottish landed gentry. See you in two. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. For many of us, it's actually going to turn quite chilly tonight. Could be a touch of frost before some rain arrives tomorrow. That's in association with a system waiting out in the Atlantic. Before that, though, we do have a ridge of high pressure building, and that's going to quieten our weather down as we go through the end of the day. So many of the daytime showers will clear away and die out, leaving a mostly dry and often clear night. As a result, because of the clear skies and a bit of a northerly wind, 
temperatures will take a bit of a drop. It's going to be markedly colder than some recent nights. Touch of frost is possible, particularly in rural spots, especially across parts of Scotland. As we go through tomorrow itself then, watch out for a few pockets of mist and fog first thing. Once these clear, lots of fine sunny weather across northern and eastern parts, but towards the south and west here we are going to see clouds spilling its way in, but this won't really reach northern and eastern parts until later in the afternoon. Some wet weather around could be heavy at times, particularly across Northern Ireland, but after a chilly start, temperatures rising, so most places likely to get into double figures. Any wet weather clears through as we go through early on Sunday, so a bit of a wet start across some southeastern parts perhaps, but thereafter, Sunday actually looks largely dry, a scattering of showers for sure, and also some outbreaks of more persistent rain across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but most of us will see some sunny breaks. Monday doesn't look too wet, but further rain is on the cards for Tuesday. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Kicking off this section with Saturday's Telegraph, uh, we learn that in her own words, Susie Dent gets cold at the drop of a hat. Should she pick the hat up, put it back on and maybe get a jumper, Leo? Yeah, absolutely. Countdown sexism row as Susie Dent suggests studio air conditioning favours men. So she's revealed that she and Rachel Riley, who's also on Countdown, bring hot water bottles into the studio, blaming the air conditioning set to colder temperatures preferred by men. I mean, yeah, you could just wear clothes. We heard these things called clothes. <laughs> we put them over our skin to keep us warm. And the ten that's why, you know, me and Josh are wearing shirts and jackets. Well, you guys suffer in here, don't you? Because it's always too hot in this studio. And you I say it's the opposite. It's sexism. Yeah. But I didn't say it. it's far too hot in here. It's horrendous. Maybe she should come and work for GB News. That's yeah, like... She yeah, should. She'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel, Josh. mate. I mean, I'm not saying it's not a great place to work, bosses who are tuning in. I just mean I, yeah. her politics. I don't yes. know what her politics yes. are. And Rachel yeah. Riley is quite based on some things. No, she's amazing. Rachel Riley's like one of my heroes, you know. Uh, I think she's amazing. She spoke up against Corbyn and she gets an incredible amount of abuse and turns out she's really hot in the You'd studio. You'd let her put the thermostat <laughs> anywhere she liked, wouldn't you? <laughs> um, we hear this a lot, though, don't we, that, that the world's built for men and not for ladies. Uh, yeah. We've just had International Women's Day again. Um, yeah, where we, we turned the uh, thermostat up. When's it going to be? When's it going to be International Men's Day? I wonder what they still want when it comes around. I think I'm here. Um, I think. No. I think if we're going to have International Women's Day, we should have it. Uh, we should discuss not being a CEO and being allowed to stay at home with the kids if you want and being left alone. <laughs> that would be my my suggestion. Mm. Okay. Uh, that's you that. recover that? You, you feel, feel like you <laughs> vented? Yes, I've had my rant. Thank you very much. Uh, the Daily Mail now, Josh. Uh, we're still asking: Does Labour have a, have a woman problem? Uh, yes, Liz Truss, I don't know if anyone remembers her, she was the uh, Prime Minister about four Tory Prime Ministers ago, uh, accuses Labour of putting ideology above protecting children after MPs filibuster to block her proposed law banning biological men from women-only spaces. This was a good law that she was trying to implement. There is some confusion over the Equality Act of 2010 mm -hmm. uh, in that w the exact definition of sex, and she wants to make it biological sex, so that protects women's spaces, women's sport, 
That all seems eminently sensible. And Labour have uh, shot themselves in the foot, I believe, mm -hmm. by causing this filibuster because it was a private member's bill and if they ran out of time, then it would get put to the bottom of the list and there's no chance of it really coming back now. Uh, the only positive is Kemi Badenoch is also looking into something similar which could be introduced by the government. But this is not a good look for Labour MPs to have behaved this way. It's incredibly immature, more so than anything, because... Let's have the debate. Absolutely. To just do it like this and just to... Yeah. They were very immature in talking about, like, pet names and whatnot. But that has been the problem all along. So much of this toxicity could have been avoided if places like Stonewall didn't have these hashtag no debate. If you have an argument, if you believe you have a strong, good argument, that's also the purpose of the channel, make your case. Don't just 100%. be all superior about it and think, oh, no, we don't even have to talk about it. Yeah, 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 because actually this, this could be argued against, you know, Liz Truss was suggesting that we ban all biological males from women's spaces, but what about the really hot trans who put the effort in and are totally convincing? And they're gonna, it's going to be weird if they're standing at the urinal. Do you know, <laughs> sometimes I think about those really hot trans women and I think, like, 20 years ago, we didn't, we didn't talk about this, did we? It wasn't... when Before it became a movement, I'm sort of being serious about yeah. this, I wouldn't have thought anything of it if I saw a trans woman in the toilets and perhaps, I hate this phrase, but if she didn't pass, if I, if I thought... I wouldn't feel any kind of uh, bad feeling towards that person. I know some people disagree with this, they don't want any biological males in women's spaces but it's it's this kind of thing that's got it to this level isn't it it's not being prepared to have the debate it's not being prepared mm. to talk about okay well this could happen i mean even if you're a trans person and your I transition am. is the best thing mm. like leo's that's ever happened to her um wouldn't you still be concerned to look into the dark corners of where it could go wrong for oh, other yeah, people yeah, yeah, yeah. the trans debate has been hijacked by these lumpy right. fetishists who have got you know they're not genuine trans people right. you know and people like eddie is are just like come on yeah you're not. They're transvestites. Surprise! So, where have transvestites gone? They're now called trans, you know, trans well, women. I That's feel, what they're... I mean, obviously, there's other people, lots of stakeholders in this debate. But my heart absolutely breaks for trans people who weren't causing any trouble and were just trying to get on with their life. And now, and now it's in the headlines every day. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, I... it's going to be. It's it's too short now, isn't it? The time left for the Conservatives. Yeah, to actually to do some governing and... So all this is is a kind of beacon that they're throwing out to say, this is what... We're... It's like, let's have a look at what you could have won. It's... Well, exactly, if they'd actually done any governing over the last 13 yeah. years. I mean, all of this stuff obviously came through under a Tory government because they tried to outlay la Labour, Labour. Now Labour have finally figured out that 50% of the population are actually women and going, oh, uh, actually, men shouldn't be in women's sports. But now you have Labour MPs behaving like this. Uh, Maria Eagle, I believe, was one of them. She's the twin of... Angela Eagle, uh, who, oh, coincidentally, got 100 grand from Glad, which is a... Uh, what, what a coincidence, then. What a coincidence. OK, uh, the Telegraph now and Scottish landowners are longing for a nanny state. They'd prefer that. They want it re to replace the devouring... Uh, the devouring mother of a state that Humza Yousaf gets so excited about, Leo. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so Can you explain that joke, please? <laughs> no, I can't even write it. <laughs> Hamza Yusuf uh, plots a crackdown on landed gentry, so he's spotted another successful part of Scotland that hasn't yet been driven out and into penury. So he's uh, putting through the land reform bill, which uh, uh, would force those with more than 1,000 hectares of land to sell in little chunks instead of as a whole to give... Uh, they say it'll make rural communities more sustainable by giving locals more of a chance to buy land. But for me, as somebody who used to work in the rural economy, I used to work as a grouse beater and, and you know, do other things in the countryside, because uh, my dad's a gunsmith and I grew up on the grouse moors, uh, the, the countryside is already being... <laughs> it's already sustained and managed by people who know what they're yeah. doing. What we don't need is a bunch of, uh, like, effect urban intellectual communists to come in and destroy what is a functioning economy, which is what, exactly what they're doing. I mean, uh, the, this, is, this is basically a sort of lighter version of what they did in Zimbabwe, uh, where they come in and say, no, you can't own that, you can't, you can't do this, you can't run that, we've got all these new regulations, and then the economy falls apart and everybody starves. <laughs> I know, but it, it is incredible that there's 1,000, essentially 1,000 people who pretty much own 70% of Scotland. Oh, okay. That, that... Here we go. So the lefty in you is saying, let's no, no. I'm just saying, no, no. I'm just, I'm not saying it's right at all. I'm just saying 
when you start looking at the figures about who actually owns this country, it goes down to a very limited number of people. I don't agree with this policy. Also, it's for show, because 93% of land sales anyway were less than 500 hectares. So it's, it's not even like they're selling 1,000 hectares at once anyway. Right. It's just it's, no, but, it's but a they are, I mean, the 93% of sales by, by volume, not by land mass. So the, no, the, no, big, I know. the big sales can be very, can be very large. Well, they could be, but they haven't even said what... It's only a percent, one percent of Scotland land is sold off annually, anyway. So yeah, I really don't know how many this idea. is going to apply to. Yeah, but no, you don't buy a house every every year. So I mean, this does. I mean, this basically meddling. Me, oh yeah, meddling in the rural economy. Like the SNP's done it before. You know, they they want they want to go in. They want to uh, stop grouse shooting. They've, they've got these ideas. So like for grouse shooting, for example, it's seen as a lot of. So a lot of urbanites see it as this cruel thing where people pay money to blast birds out of the sky. And yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is where do you think your food comes from? Like you think, you know, you basically when food is killed, Del it's, it's killed. Yeah, you've got, you got some guy in a warehouse, some disinterested minimum wage guy hitting a calf in the head, in the head with a plank. Like, Well, yeah, I mean, that's a great point, isn't it? Shooting the, small things where you can see the whites of its eyes is completely yeah. different and the, and the mass grouse, farming. The grouse leads a natural life uh, like free from free from all these chemicals and free from being intensively reared and you know the the environment has to be maintained and that, doing bullet, that bullet doing that provides <laughs> no, doing that provides well it's not a bullet it's shot because you can't shoot them with a with a uh, rifle but um, lots of bullets through the head I've never eaten something that's got shot in it is, no. you, is it spitting bits out like pips is what I well, a little little bit sometimes it's not it's not much of a Maybe. not much of a bother that's good for but you the, but the environment is maintained and sustained so the grouse can live there so then it creates an environment that lots of other uh, flora and fauna can live there. And if, if you don't have the grouse there, then it's used for the next most profitable use, which is often blanket coniferous forestry, which actually toxifies the soil, is a complete monoculture, destroys water courses downstream because it acidifies them. So it's, it's a disaster. And nobody, nobody in the SNP would even know any of that. I'm no, amazed. No. I, I can't believe you're not best friends with Chris Packham. That is stunning. <laughs> OK, staying with The Telegraph, and yet another story designed to worry headliners panellists. Josh. Mercedes rolls out human-like robots for dull and repetitive factory tasks. What's strange about this, and this is, uh, like I said, Mercedes, they've teamed up with a Texas-based company, is that these robots actually are human-sized as well. So I don't know if they're going to kind of make them talk and be... Oh, there we go. And they'll be like, oh, right, oh did you see the sun? <laughs> no, that looks like that Bjork video. You know, all is oh, love. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. They, do kind of look, directed. they do kind of look like what you sort of imagine robots look like. Instead of like normally we see yeah. robots in a in a car factory, they're just like an arm moving yes. around. Mm. Disappointing. So uh, I think we need more immigration. <laughs> That's my take on this. More immigration. I'd less robots. Fewer robots. Fewer robots. Yes. More immigration. And, uh, yeah, they, they, it's repetitive tasks to indefatigable machines. And I used to know what that word meant before COVID. Uh, but <laughs> George, unfortunately... George Galloway knows. Oh, really? So, well, he yeah, described, he likes described Saddam Hussein as indefatigable, but I don't think Saddam Hussein would last long in a car factory, to be honest. But, yeah, this is, this is great. And this shows that if, if you invest in tech, if you invest in, uh, in, in robots to do the jobs people don't want to do, then you don't need to have open borders and, you know, an unlimited supply of cheap labour coming over the border. Or humans! <laughs> or humans, yeah, lovely. At the Metro now, who knew Russian polling stations were the best place for a children's birthday party, Leo? So day one of Russian elections is already leaving people baffled uh, while the result is expected. <laughs> I, love, I love how the Metro says expected. expected. Oh, it's, yeah, it's up in the air a bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> Classic Metro. Uh, I guess they're communists, so they, 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 love, they, they love it when Vladimir Putin wins. Uh, so uh, Vladimir Putin, another term as president, some of the weird and wonderful happenings at polling stations have been taking centre stage. There have been people dressing up as all kinds of cartoon characters, a polar bear, I think an anteater, uh, just and Spider-Man as well, uh, because this is uh, everybody knows that this is just a, a ritual public display. It's an acclamation. It's something that goes back to the Roman times. Even the Soviets held these fake elections to give the leader some sort of veneer of legitimacy, which he obviously doesn't have. And we've seen, you know, any anybody who challenges Putin politically, uh, not just Navalny, who ended up being killed, but uh, Igor Gherkin or Strelkov, as he's as he's known, he's he's in jail now, and uh, Boris Nad Nadezhdin. Uh, he got he got enough signatures to stand and was was denied. Um, so yeah, it's an absolute sham. But in the West, we're not doing much better. Uh, so Gert Wilders was uh, was got by far the biggest proportion of the vote in the 
dodge election. So the people were obviously like, we let like Gert Wilders, we voted for him, please make him prime minister. Uh, he's the, the dictators who really run things have decided, no, you're not allowed well, to have it's him. A, as... It's proportional representation. So he only got 33 out of 150 seats. He got by far the oh, most. Right. His party he got, got by got the far the most. The 33 out of, uh, out of 100. Uh, I mean, okay. like, that's. Well, that's, their point is that that's the system that they've got there. That's, and a, that's, that's what a plurality. They have to, that's no, the system they've got is like if any other party, if a centrist party or some sort of weird lefty party had won that number of seats, they'd automatically be prime minister. But because uh, because the people who really run things have decided, you know, the sort of to use right. Lewis Schaefer's phrase, the the one world government have decided, no, Gert Wilders, Gert Wilders yeah. can't can't be allowed, even though people voted for him, uh, he's, he's not allowed. Okay. But yeah, it's uh, but it is uh, it is interesting how the difference between elections, as Leo says, it's a way it's like it's, it's for show because it's meaningless. Whereas when you come when it comes to the UK, it never feels fun. Everybody's very grim and they're no, in the it queue. it feels like a sort of it's parents' like, evening kind yeah, of vibe. So, oh, it's God. not. It's am not I, a fun. Am thing. I going to cross? I crossed the wrong thing. <laughs> Right, one section to go. Uh, we've got bad art, pop-up strip clubs, and why today is the day karaoke died. Thrilling stuff. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. So after his mad dash to see his father last week, Prince Harry predictively went on TV to talk about it. He gave his first interview to Good Morning America, whilst apparently being filmed by a cruise that were doing a documentary on the Invictus Games. He didn't disclose his father's diagnosis, but frankly, even the fact that he was on TV talking about it was concerning. No wonder they're keeping him at arm's length. This is what he said. How did you get the news that the King was ill? Um, I spoke to him. And what did you do next? I jumped on a plane and, and went to go see him as soon as I could. How was that visit for you emotionally? Um, look, I, 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 love, I love my family. The fact, that I was, the fact that I was able to get on a plane and go and see him and spend any time with him, I'm grateful for that. An illness in the family can have a galvanizing or sort of reunifying effect for a family. Absolutely. Is that possible in this case? Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, you know, I've, uh, throughout all these families, I see it on a, on a day to day basis. Um, you know, the, again, the, the strength of the, of the family unit coming together. Hmm. He also said that he loves his family, but then he said that he had his own family in America. So which family does he love? The late Queen's last few years of life were marred with accusations of racism, which Harry later backtracked on, claiming that they hadn't actually used the word, so inadvertently admitting to gaslighting us all. But the Sussex's stock is falling in the States, and the only thing that makes them interesting is their proximity to the royal family. And now the King is ill... Harry has even offered to muck in and take on official duties to help his father. Look, I want to see reconciliation and love and joy, but I'm afraid Meghan has yet to even speak to her father as far as we know, and Harry didn't apparently even reach out to his brother. Whilst his dad might fall for it, I doubt William will be as soft. Good luck with that, Harry. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Headliners. Starting with The Telegraph and news about some public art designed as a symbol of our shared present and future ambitions. What's your inner critic saying, Leo? <laughs> so, Sadiq Khan has approved plans to install a statue of a black every woman on Trafalgar Square's fourth plinth as an apparent symbol of equity in the capital. Oh, it's about, ti it's about time. It's about time there was some representation by Sadiq Khan of, uh, of, of black women. Uh, so Lady in Blue, a painted bronze statue by New York artist... A picture of it here. 
Shabala la la self. That's genuinely oh, her name. I'm not being like. Uh, no, no, but uh, it's like yeah, sort of sort of Robert is. Crumb. Do you know Robert yeah, Crumb? Yeah, like, yeah. Robert Crumb. Big fan of Crumb. Sexy. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's been confirmed as the latest sculpture to be installed on the plinth and the final remaining piece of uh, of your vision that won't be filled by uh, by diversity. Uh, but it's not the it's not the only diversity it's going to have. In September, the cast of 850 trans people, some of whom are sex workers, Yay. obviously, uh, are going to be up there. And, say them again. And it's going to replace <laughs> Samson Kambalu's antelope, which depicts a statue of John Chilembwe, a black pastor who tried to lead an uprising in colonial Nyasaland. And had a... <laughs> You've been practicing that for the last three hours. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm just like... Man, can we, well, what about Cockneys? Can Cockneys get any representation in no, London? They're not equity we, enough. We not just have one little, tiny, little, tiny, little rep, like just recognition that there, there were there were some like people in London. So that... cynical, Leo. London's built on all that. Um, so, th so there are changes, doesn't it? That's the point. It's like a graffiti wall. I'm from Bristol. We have graffiti walls. You get to be on it for so long, and then somebody else comes along. Yeah. Um, and so. I don't really understand the selection process here. Is this, are they all Sadiq Khan, or is this just the first it one? It eventually goes to Sadiq Khan to approve it, and it gets whittled down from, right. you know, hundreds of people. Not to him to do his own art. No. I, I quite like that blue woman in blue. I like the colour, I, quite, yeah. It's, yeah, it's I, it looks quite nice. Uh, but someone had mentioned about being the uh, late Queen Elizabeth II. Mm. I, I think, personally... I mean, I think, let's have, I think it's a good idea to have, like, a rotating art... Space. I like that idea. I think it has worked for the last quarter century. But I think that the Queen was pretty cool and she should have her own big old statue. I there. think it's really weird that we're not having a statue for the Queen. Yeah. I mean, she, she was so the Queen that she's just called the Queen. You know, mm. I still stumble. I'm so sorry, Camilla. Th Every should... time. I hear the Queen, She's I the think Queen of Regent. the Queen. We should have a statue of, uh, of the Hamas chief who's given a council house in Sadiq Khan's London. Interesting. Well, let's submit that to Sadiq Khan. OK, uh, next story. I'm a woman. We don't like strip clubs, especially ones called Pop-Up. That's a bit unfortunate, isn't it? <laughs> Is it Josh, what's this in The Guardian about Pop-Up strip clubs? Very nice. Uh, women at Cheltenham feel threatened by Pop-Up strip clubs, say minister. So, obviously, you've got the Cheltenham uh, Festival Council going on at the moment. Uh, and they have, yeah, I didn't know this. Uh, I didn't know, I did, and I'm from round there, suppose, and I had no idea. And supposedly, going when it's going on, they go, they put up a strip club for all those <laughs> blokes who rock up and want to see some naked women during the Cheltenham Festival. I, I guess. I had no idea. But they're that saying, saying that not... women feel threatened in the town centre. I would, but what they've not done is do a correlation between that it's because of the strip clubs or it's just because there's a lot more men around, a lot more alcohol flowing. I don't, they don't there's nothing here to say that it's because of the strip clubs yeah. that's why women are feeling Or is it just because women have feelings and they like to feel things and so when they see these men, they, they feel threatened. Imagine if... Imagine if somebody said, oh, look, I've seen I feel threatened now. The other, other people would go, oh, that's, well, that's racist or that's whateverist. Trans, that's transphobic. No, but I think women have a... have reasonable... Uh, no, nope. uh, to, to feel that way. I agree. Alcohol makes a boisterous environment. I mean, I don't like this, but I would just say, don't like the strip clubs. I, no, why would you want that? Cheltenham's but, quite posh. It's but nice. also, if we're going to talk about women's rights and stuff like that, uh, I, I like supporting uh, single mothers through a series of microtransactions at just these all heart, establishments. Yeah. The Daily Mail now claims that Red Nose Day was a bigger deal when two straight white men doing uncle at a wedding dancing were promoting it. That can't be right, can it, Leo? So nostalgic Brits claim that Red Nose Day used to to be a bigger deal, noting how little build-up there has been this year as epic 1990s comic relief video resurfaces online. I mean, who gets nostalgic for Red Nose Day? Is this David Brent? This is ri ridiculous. But, yeah, th these people on um, the internet or whatever have been... I mean, this isn't an article, this is just stuff off the internet. Uh, so somebody's saying, like, oh, back in the day, it was such such a big deal. Uh, there was more stuff, there's more stuff to do in the world now. People don't have time to care about world poverty anymore, nor the attention span for Red Nose Day. Oh, yeah, that, that famous... <laughs> That, f that famously difficult and arduous. It was like fi finishing Ulysses. It was... <laughs> but it does yeah. feel like it was part of the cultural fabric at the time. It was a huge deal. It was... Uh, I remember that first year, everybody was desperately trying to get these red noses and they were, they'd were they sold out everywhere in, uh, in the ensuing years. There were genuinely funny sketches through that time. And I would say that the reason why this is somewhat important... I didn't even know today was Red Nose Day. Oh, it's today? No, I Yeah, exactly, yeah. It is because... 
I would say it's indicative of what comedy has turned into. <laughs> now, look, there's, look, there's good things. Someone here from uh, Molly King, who's uh, some singer Saturday, she's raised a million quid. That's great stuff, raising good money. But in terms of... There used to be sort of water cooler moments and it feels like danger has gone out yeah. of it. Any risk has gone out of it. Well, and it's and, and also we've got, we've got to... We're just going to quickly squeeze in this story about karaoke uh, in oh. the Metro. Uh, who's got this? Josh. Yes, Can't man invented go. karaoke, has badly sung his final song and died 100. Oh. Uh, it's very sad, but he actually died in January 29th and his daughter kept it secret from us! She kept his death sick. Wow, that's that's darker than I would expect for the the king of karaoke. Uh, okay, the show is oh, nearly over. Me to the so let's take another quick look at Saturday's front pages. Uh, the Daily Mail: Plot to crown Morden as PM. The Telegraph has Mercer faces jail over Afghan inquiry. The Times has Church playing race card. iNews has Deliveroo and Uber Eats backdoor to illegal migration. Express has Hunt's olive branch to fearful pensioners. And finally, the Daily Star, mystery of the rampant beavers. And those were your front pages. Uh, that's all we have time for. Thank you for my guests, Josh and Leo. I'll be back tomorrow with Lewis uh, and Nick. Uh, if you're watching at 5 a.m., stay tuned for breakfast. <laughs> Good night. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. For many of us, it's actually going to turn quite chilly tonight. Could be a touch of frost before some rain arrives tomorrow. That's in association with a system waiting out in the Atlantic. Before that, though, we do have a ridge of high pressure building, and that's going to quieten our weather down as we go through the end of the day. So many of the daytime showers will clear away and die out, leaving a mostly dry and often clear night. As a result, because of the clear skies and a bit of a northerly wind, Temperatures will take a bit of a drop. It's going to be markedly colder than some recent nights. Touch of frost is possible, particularly in rural spots, especially across parts of Scotland. As we go through tomorrow itself, then watch out for a few pockets of mist and fog first thing. Once these clear, lots of fine sunny weather across northern and eastern parts. But towards the south and west here, we are going to see clouds spilling its way in. But this won't really reach northern and eastern parts until later in the afternoon. Some wet weather around could be heavy at times, particularly across Northern Ireland. But after a chill start, temperatures rising, so most places likely to get into double figures. Any wet weather clears through as we go through early on Sunday, so a bit of a wet start across some southeastern parts perhaps, but thereafter Sunday actually looks largely dry, a scattering of showers for sure, and also some outbreaks of more persistent rain across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, but most of us will see some sunny breaks. Monday doesn't look too wet, but further rain is on the cards for Tuesday. I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping it.